episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome uh, once again, everybody, to another episode of our show, bringing you another truly fascinating guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us on many different fronts. Uh, we are continuing what I referred to as our virtual uh, road trip around the world. Uh, today, we are headed over to the country of Bahrain, uh, and we are going to be meeting with a surgeon, entrepreneur, and futurist, uh, Dr. Sanaf Reed, uh, who ultimately strives to utilize emerging technologies to make the world a better place and has been key to uh, pushing forward a vision uh, and the boundaries of innovation through her extensive research and development activities uh, using uh, a, a range of immersive technologies like extended reality. Uh, Dr. Farid is a driving force in the progression of these immersive technologies. Uh, she's been hailed as one of the top 100 women in extended reality globally uh, due to her achievements in creating various industry standards, implementation strategies, best practices, practices for organizations around these advanced tools. Uh, Dr. Fareed's major work involves helping organizations implement extended reality uh, with a successful and scalable strategy, and she's an avid researcher determined uh, to use future tech solutions for overall societal well-being. A qualified surgeon, uh, as well as a distinguished ambassador of women empowerment programs in the region, uh, she supports government and non-governmental initiatives, uh, leading them to envision, strategize, ultimately streamline the suite of artificial intelligence, augmented virtual reality uh, based programs in various sectors, healthcare, of course, but also she's involved in aviation, education, and public services. Uh, Dr. Fareed uh, got her medical degree from Dow University of Health Sciences. Uh, she did uh, her general surgery uh, fellowship at the King Hamad University Hospital in Bahrain. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. So Dr. Sana Fareed, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk to us on the show. It's such a pleasure to be with you, Ira. Thank you for having me. It, it's great having you. Um, I'd like to, uh, as we typically do on the show, sort of start off by passing you the uh, the microphone for a little while to further introduce yourself. If you could talk a little bit about where you grew up, when you developed your interest in medicine, and then I noticed that you know you uh, you were focused early in your career on trauma and vascular surgery. Uh, how that whole part of your career led into your interest in this simulation virtual reality tools? I think that'd be a great way to start things off. Uh, yes, great. So um, I've uh, grown up here in Bahrain, and um, I think my interest in science was from the early days of the schools. I found uh, science to be driving the curiosity out of me. And I think for as long as I remember, I have always wanted to be in the science field. So I have been uh, shifting my passion among different subjects. I love mathematics. I have loved science or space. Until finally, um, I decided to, you know, um, go to medical school. So this was the start. So I think the, the entire environment or the school environment, my teachers have all helped me to shape up my decision in the future. And yes, during the time of my medical school, I was absolutely fascinated by uh, cardiovascular surgery. And I actually, I don't have a, a specific reason to explain for that. It's just that anytime I would have a free uh, summertime or winter break, I would be uh, doing internships in different departments. And these type of activities help you find your future on which area are you finding your passion. So for me, immediately, it was that the decision to be in a surgical field, that was number one. And I absolutely love the cardiovascular surgery because I have seen its life-saving impact. And this is I'm talking about um, roughly about 10 years back when I was a medical student. Uh, from there, I have tried to work literally in every hospital where there was a cardiac surgery department to understand the different ways uh, surgeons are working because every surgeon is bringing the experience from their area uh, where they got trained. And that's how I got to learn. And it was just amazing. However, with the advancing of the medical technologies and therapeutics uh, in, in the entire world and in every um, sector, uh, particularly a lot of the surgical procedures, operational procedures are moving towards non-operative management, which is something which is amazing for the entire world. 
It just means uh, safer practices. It means lesser cost. It means access of quality healthcare to more and more patients. Today, we are talking about literally, you know, eliminating diseases like diabetes, diseases like high blood pressure, which are chronically and worse than, than the, the current pandemic situation. But these have been there for so long and they literally eat up a large section of the entire economy of the healthcare sector. So um, this was the time when I was uh, probably practicing as a surgeon. I have always been passionate about doing more and more. And I think this is something that comes naturally when you're working with people. You can be uh, a doctor, a nurse, a lawyer, a teacher. I think the more you work with people, you envision that now I'm able to reach 100, I want to reach 100,000 in the future. So I think this idea is always there in your head. And at the same time, I realized that today is the right time for it. You will be hearing from a lot of prominent speakers that they would quote that today is the best time to be alive in healthcare in terms of technology or in terms of quality care. And I absolutely agree with that. We have a spent, you know, centuries, not decades, but centuries in building a certain um, type of drugs, certain types of pain management, uh, regular patient management and all of that. Now, just the time, we have also spent centuries building technology, building the infrastructure. So I think now is the absolute time where we are merging everything all together. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is how um, I'm very passionate about healthcare as well and about technology as well. And I just try to find a way on how to combine my passion uh, together. Outstanding. You know, it's it, thinking about when you're talking about things like cardiovascular disease, obviously in the middle of the pandemic, we forget uh, all about the non-communicable diseases. But as you were mentioning, heart disease is an example, a, a major killer still around the world uh, of millions of people. Um, you know, some of the areas that that sort of within your technology suite, things like artificial intelligence, digital health. We talked a little bit about on the show, but with some of these other tools, the extended reality, augmented reality, uh, mixed reality, uh, not, not so much. I was wondering, obviously, I know you give lectures on, on these themes, but could you take us on a little path through sort of this umbrella term that encompasses extended reality? And then I guess focusing, say, on cardiovascular disease or anything else that you want to talk about. Talk about some of your future visions. What is the most, some of the most exciting things utilizing these tools, whether it's in cardiovascular disease or other non-communicable diseases that you're most excited about now and looking out say five years? Yeah, um, great question. So uh, yes, we do have a, a plethora of technologies. And of course, as an individual or even as a, as a single organization or university, we will not be implementing everything that is available in the market. What we need to understand fundamentally about digital health, this is a transformation. This is an absolute revolution that we're living in. And I'm sure you have seen a lot of the leading speakers. What is the one keyword that we all unite to? The, that keyword is not a particular technology, but it is the convergence, you know? Yep. Uh, so this is absolutely, so when you are, Simple example about this, it asks you to describe your perfect breakfast. I highly doubt that you will mention one item. It's always a combination <laughs> of things, plus the environment, plus the weather outside, plus your plan for the rest of the day. These are the things that make a perfect day. And a perfect day just means a happy person, which is you. Similarly, when we're witnessing a revolution in any industry, it's about a convergence, yes, but... You start by, you start somewhere. You either start by unlocking the key or opening the door or simply by thinking in your head that I want to cross that door and I want to another part where there is a hell a lot of uh, betterment and uh, good for everybody. So um, particularly if we focus on extended reality, I think XR, in the future, I don't know what the term will be, but I think XR has given us the power 
to literally um, teleport anywhere, to literally be able to reach to places where it's definitely impossible for us to reach. You know, today we are able to teleport to the space as well, to literally feel that we are inside a space shuttle or even on the surface of, of the moon or of the Mars. Now, until now, many uh, of the people were using it, including myself, we are probably using it for entertainment purposes, for experimental purposes, and for some minor activities. However, if you think about the potential that you're literally being teleported to anywhere, and if you want to meet somebody who's in a completely different uh, continent, how about you are able to meet with each other in a metaverse in real time? So, and how about if you're able to share knowledge, share your expertise, how much time, how much uh, money is that going to save you? And how frequent you will be able to do this compared to the real traveling? So I absolutely believe that XR has given us the power of uh, science fiction that was never there before. What, um, you know, you are, as mentioned, you're very active, uh, not just on the uh, bioscience eco entrepreneurial ecosystem, the, the tech ecosystem in the region. Um, I think sitting here in the, in the uh, United States East Coast, I think we hear, I guess, more in our press and maybe in, in the in the popular um, uh, movies and and so forth. Uh, more about, say, the United Arab Emirates and Dubai. Um, talk a little bit about the biotech entrepreneurial ecosystem in Bahrain and some of uh, how you've been involved in, in developing things on that entrepreneurship front? Um, yes, again, a very, very interesting question because and I particularly love to answer this because until now, I, I do meet a lot of people from, from the Western countries and they probably, many of them are aware of the ecosystem here, but many of them are not. Um, I have started my entrepreneurial journey um, here in Bahrain. Uh, but very soon we have expanded to uh, the entire GCC or the Gulf countries, which is UAE, Dubai, Saudi Arabia. So that's why I will uh, describe overall how it's happening. So UAE has recently, you know, um, in uh, sometime in the past six months, has been the ranked number one in the Middle East and number four globally in the Global Entrepreneurship Index. Um, there are tremendous opportunities and infrastructure and an ecosystem for entrepreneurship, particularly in the UAE. What happens in the UAE or in, in, in Dubai will be reflecting on all the neighboring countries because it's similar like, uh, you know, encouraging the environment or encouraging the entire ecosystem. Um, Knowledge-based economy has been a prime focus of the entire government of this part of the world, the Middle East, and we are almost out of the, uh, the oil-based uh, GDP. What has the government done? Uh, not only the government, but also some private initiatives has been launched to support entrepreneurship. We understand that in the knowledge economy, it's going to be a part of multi levels of the society involving the students involving institutes involving research organizations as well as the government so the entire ecosystem has been very supportive the taxes are either none or very minimal uh, the, the uh, accelerators or business incubators are growing tremendously and they offer great bundles so this is mainly how um, we have learned about uh, business accelerators and business incubators is that they would not only provide you a shelter or a home for your idea, but also help you to nurture that idea, reach to an investment stage, uh, meet with collaborators, meet with um, advisors, meet with investors and so on. Then uh, if you uh, are aware of Dubai in particular, we have some of the largest activities throughout the year. And also we have been with JITEX 2020 uh, last year in October, it was the first physical event to happen during the COVID-19 
uh, Erba. It was the first event to be held completely uh, physically, of course, with it, what that means is that, of course, it's great for the business, for the for the exhibition business, but it also means that there was a huge responsibility on the regulatory authorities to maintain all the rules and regulations of following the COVID-19. We have had international um, competitions. We have had visitors internationally and the entire conference was uh, ended very successfully. Then we are continuing, since after JATX, we're continuing to have physical activities. Tomorrow, we are opening doors to World Expo 2020 with over 180 pavilions of different countries. So you can imagine, we're expected to see millions and millions of visitors from around the world. So it just means that all of these opportunities means or all of these initiatives and events happening just means that there is a lot of opportunities uh, for entrepreneurs. And it's just about us that we need to think of an idea on how to get into it. And, you know, continuing along that, but aside from your active promotion uh, of STEM uh, in the region, you, you are a major proponent of obviously women in STEM in the region and, and beyond the region. Uh, you're involved with organizations like Women of Wearables, where you're uh, connecting women on various technologies and fashion tech, smart textiles, uh, IoT. Uh, you're involved with uh, women tech makers in Abu Dhabi. Uh, please talk a little bit about uh, women in STEM in the region and in some of your visions there and obviously your leadership on this front. So um, women are actually having some very privileged opportunities in this part of the world. In every country, in every city, there are women based or women in influence or women led organizations that are promoting um, STEM, promoting health, promoting uh, well-being, child care, family care, and basically every sector. Uh, the fact is that since decades, we do have a large number of women in STEM up to the university level. So uh, according to the data, 70% of STEM graduates would be females. However, the number would come down to 30% in the job market. Mm. Today, this is the history. Today, this is no longer a fact. In fact, more than 60% of STEM jobs are uh, being, cover being uh, done by uh, women. Uh, for me, fundamentally, um, gender equality is only a translation to eliminating the gender gap. This is what I mean. It does not mean that you're giving anybody a privilege that they don't deserve. It just means that you're literally eliminating gender, uh, race, age, and you're just bringing a whole lot of diversity together to get the work done and to deliver impact. Mm. This has been the number one motive of governments, of, uh, of organizations to attract creative minds, to attract talents that are able to make a change regardless of where they are coming from or what language do they speak or what gender or what race do they belong to. So first of all, it's a very, very um, uh, diverse environment that we live in. And it is very, and we do have, uh, if, you, if, if you are aware of that, the UAE is also having a ministry of tolerance. The ministry of tolerance is the first in the world. What it means is that UAE is home to more than 180 country, uh, nationalities. Mm -hmm which means if you enter a hospital or if you enter a school, you actually see a diverse group of people. The aim is to provide equal treatment, equal education, equal healthcare to all of them. And this has literally, you know, helped us to uh, not to be indulged in the challenges more and more, but to be focused on innovation and creativity. And whoever is, having the experience of even living here, they will see the diversity. They, you see it's literally everywhere in every treatment. You don't feel the bias in anywhere. And this is absolutely essential because as uh, creative people, as providers of education or providers of healthcare, we need to focus on the outcome. Mm -hmm. 
So the entire ecosystem has been extremely supportive. And I think this is only going to help us in the long run. And, and you know, thinking uh, about this further, uh, obviously uh, equity, uh, an extremely important topic all around the world nowadays. And, and needless to say, we have uh, in 2021, we still have tremendous underprivileged populations all around the world. Uh, I know you're passionate about using some of these tools like the Extended Reality Suite uh, to go beyond these boundaries, spread education, health, communication to various underprivileged communities. Talk a little bit, if you would, about some of your uh, thoughts and, and initiatives in this area. Okay, so um, again, a great question. And I think uh, by this you are, I mean, by your uh, question, I would like to shed more light about how a small step or an initiative or a creative idea can help you actually reach far to places where you can not even imagine. So yeah. um, as you know, so yes, my number one, that my, I started with my career in medicine, then it was shaped into education, and then it was shaped into technology and XR. Um, with this, of course, I have been working, following my passion, following the research and everything, but it opened many doors for me to be able to do a lot more than I could do uh, being only a surgeon. So um, a couple of years back, I have been uh, approached by uh, the government of Nigeria just for, uh, just for um, a lecture or a talk to inspire their a teacher about um, STEM related career and surprising, uh, it was not surprising for me, but 90% or more of the audience were women. And with one lecture, they were so excited about XR, about emerging tech, about affordable education that they just wanted to do more. Um, with this great uh, introduction to the um, to this country, this uh, amazing country and amazing people, they were very very passionate, and uh, all of a sudden I started to receive many many uh, ideas that they want to work on women, particularly uh, women in STEM. They wanted to improve the education, and they wanted to work. Uh, they wanted to improve a lot of the stuff and also be innovative. So what we did is that. Um, can you imagine that we were able to reach uh, underprivileged uh, communities where some of them even lack a basic school building? They lack a proper desk and a table, but we were able to teleport them around the world with simple tools. Uh, technology today is not only very advancing, but it is also very, very affordable. World organizations like WHO, United Nations, many of the nonprofit organizations are already spending a huge sum of amount in improving these countries. However, it sometimes with the small tools, you're able to use that. So simply we use Google Cardboard, which is costing us not more than three to four dollars, but that five dollars device is able to literally teleport your student to the outer space. What is that going to do? You know, it's not going to, is that going to provide food on their uh, plate that night? No. Is that going to give them a degree um, in lesser time? No. It's going to open their minds. You know, you show them something and open. Uh, I, I don't know if you've, uh, you've seen the movie, the, the Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. It's, yep. it's been on Netflix. And I, yep. if anybody asks me for a movie recommendation, that's definitely on top of my list. So I truly believe in that the change Instead of me bringing a change to an, a community that I don't know of, I know it from the press, I know it from the TV, the change comes from within you. You know how we always talk to our patients that you need to be very determined, you need to be positive. Mm -hmm. Change in every community, in every society, in every third world country will be coming from themselves. I think for me, uh, Living in a, in a very, very good place with electricity, with running water, I think it's a responsibility that I should outreach to those people and just open their minds and tell them that now is the time, you have the right tools available, just get up. And the moment you extend your hand, you will see a lot of people extending their hands at you. So my involvement has been, I have been very active, but I think I was not able to do anything if 
I did not receive in tremendous passion and encouragement from the other people because uh, you are not able to help anybody if they're not willing or not believing in transformation as a whole. And our part as scientists or as innovators is basically just opening minds. This is something that I truly, truly believe in. So, uh, Dr. Farid, you, you just recently mentioned the term transformation, and I know you're um, actively involved in the principle of industry 4.0 transformation uh, per the digital transformation of uh, various aspects of different industries. Uh, talk about your interest, uh, if you would, in this particular space. Yes, a uh, very, very important question. So earlier, as we were talking about the conversions of uh, technologies and technologies converging to bring an impact. I absolutely think it is also the conversions of industries and we have not had a better lesson for this uh, better than the, the, the current pandemic. Healthcare has been an absolute essential in every industry. Whenever, let's say if we take an example of um, aviation industry or oil and gas industry, if you are working in an oil and gas industry, for any future program, you will definitely be taking the health and safety in, in consideration, the healthcare in consideration, education and training in consideration. So this is how I feel as, as a humanity and as businesses, it is the conversions of basically everything that we do. And this is how, because people don't really understand how, what is the role of uh, a medical doctor talking about industry 4.0. It is absolutely, uh, natural for me to be uh, discussing about this because we are we are literally living the the industry 4.0 revolution. We have learned from the past uh, industrial revolutions that they invade our lives and they invade everything that you do, regardless you like it or not. Um, initially, I'm pretty sure that in every industrial revolution, there has been a lot of hesitation because there is lack of awareness. People are uh, probably more um, hesitant to experiment with new technologies, with new ideas. And we are, as human, we are just more comfortable in the conventional way of doing things. However, electricity came. Today, we cannot even imagine a second without electricity. I'm sure earlier, people, many people have been probably that would be a part of the third industrial revolution with the internet and the computers and everything. And of course, many people would take it negatively uh, initially. However, today we cannot imagine growing businesses, connecting to around the world with people without the internet. Similarly, the fourth industrial revolution which in one word can be translated to intelligence. Is all the technologies that we have worked with is coming to show its impact. Yes, we are still facing the lack of awareness. We are facing a uh, lack of awareness even by the governments and large industries. And I think that majority of that is because of the financial doubt that they have or the budget uh, issues that they would be considered. For me, I truly, again, believe that a revolution or an industry 4.0 transformation is a mindset. It's the mindset to perform 10x of what we were doing. It's a mindset to come out of the long-term crisis. Once we are building that mindset, many of the doors do open. So, um, we are today not in the same space we were How many governments understand that yes, technology will be the savior and we need to collaborate with, with each other to you know uh, overcome this. So I think uh, we have talking about industry 4.0 since long, but it has definitely been escalated a lot with the COVID-19. What, uh, obviously we're, we're recording uh, our show here um, it, it, the end, well, it's almost October of 2021. You mentioned the, the upcoming uh, Dubai Expo. Uh, 
what do we have to look forward to in terms of Dr. Sanafa Reed in 2022? Uh, any major announcements, lectures, talks you're going to be giving, conferences we should be watching for you uh, at? Please uh, take us on the next uh, part of the journey. Um, to be honest, um, I don't Everything has been moving so fast. Um, uh, I think I really, if I speak about, you know, uh, I'm unable to speak about my future or future plans like I used to do in the past because everything has been changing tremendously. And I'm so glad because um, I think it, it is better than what I have imagined. I have been experiencing some amazing technologies that I didn't even know that would be existing. I am communicating with people that we don't even speak the same language, but we are able to talk to each other through simulation or through some impact. So I think it's an amazing world. I really hope that um, in 2022, I would be a better as a person. Um, I, I really, to be honest, I don't know about the work or where I will be physically, but I hope that I will be a learner, a better communicator, and a better human being. I, because I know that technology is taking care of many of the things. I know that a lot of people are doing some amazing work. So uh, we also need to look about the humanity part. So I just hope that I will be better about this. But in generally speaking, we do have a lot of activities happening, a lot of school programs, especially since the schools are coming back to, uh, uh, to, to physically, uh, physical education. Medical schools are coming back. I think um, we will be in 2022 or even in, in the coming years, we are having a better understanding of what challenges can do to us and we will be better prepared to face them in quicker time with quicker actions, with quicker planning and everything. Uh, so I just think everything is going to be much quicker, much better, much more impactful and solving issues everywhere. This is what I truly believe in. It's a, it's a wonderful message and a wonderful vision. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's been fascinating, you know, reading about your journey to date and listening to you today uh, and, and really wishing you the best with all of these uh, very impactful uh, programs, moving them forward. Um, for, for everybody that uh, is going to be listening to this particular episode across our podcast networks or watching uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, you've been listening to fascinating surgeon, entrepreneur, futurist, Dr. Sanafa Reed, uh, joining us from Bahrain today, uh, giving us an exciting uh, vision of the future of extended reality, immersive technologies, and, and a lot more that's going to be happening in the coming years. Uh, Dr. Fried, it, it was really a pleasure talking to you, and I thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to, to come on our show. Thank you for what you've been doing and what you continue to do. And as we say, on our show. Thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow uh, for all of us. Very inspiring work. Thank you, Ira. It's been my pleasure to be uh, speaking to you. Thank you.